is very spread out across its three locations. Uh, the usual signs of workplace rationalization are present, so uh, the, uh, open plan, mock testing, uh, encouragement to work from home on some days for reviewing the tasking, etc. Usual measures intended to minimize expense uh, through changes to social and physical fabric of the organization. Energy is an important part of this process of change, and all three parts were designed to achieve a green rating of excellence. Uh, green being uh, an international standard which evaluates buildings on a number of measures relating to construction and the use of the building and its uh, use I'm going to focus on here. So the rationalization of energy primarily took place in the form of removing control from the individuals on the office floor and reconstituting it at a higher level of the organization in the hands of a facilities manager or FM who uh, uses the building management system or BMS. So windows are sealed, furniture and height uh, is restricted, uh, positioning of furniture is restricted, heating and lighting controls are removed, uh, personal electric devices are strictly regulated. The result is that occupants form no discretion over their immediate environment or its energy consumption. Irrational consequences stem from this rationalization that hinted at in this quote from the facilities manager. The only disadvantage of a centralized strategy is that everything is down to facilities management and everyone has no interest in the running of the building, uh, which you can see is quite a major disadvantage depending on your perspective. The process of delocalizing energy is more successful than the process of reconstituting it elsewhere. At the hub that I studied, a lot of virtual barrow growth, the facilities manager was not given one of two complex PMSs uh, which, through which to control uh, the environment. Uh, and to exercise this control that you've been given. Uh, however, the FM was seemingly highly competent and motivated. It was rather hamstrung by the fact that he was given ownership of these systems and so the energy consumption of the 500 occupants uh, without even an instruction manual for them, let alone any training. He self taught himself one of these systems and reported three years after the building it was opened, uh, the system was finally working properly. The other system he was given remains collected in dust power. To the untrained FM, this system is completely over-specified for the task. Uh, it's a bit, a bit like giving you a Ferrari to do the posting, he said. It's impossible to know whether this rationalized system led to a reduction in energy use, as it was introduced to the part of a new office environment which has greatly improved energy ratings. There were several examples of the irrational energy consumption in this new system, however, uh, including to a number of the new hubs, where seeing lights were left switched on for, for a year simply because no one programmed the BMS to turn them off. What could be evidence at the Arrow site, however, uh, was the unpopularity of the new regime, as only half of it, only, only half of the site had this regime in place. So this is a schematic of the building there. Um, one half of it is a refurbished grey to listed building, um, which they were also very constrained what they could do with it. Um, and on site is a uh, Purpose built modern annex. I think it's pretty easy to tell which one's which here. Uh, in the words of one team manager, if I took a snapshot of the building now, 99% of people would prefer to work in the old town. They have control over their environment. A similar process of delocalizing energy responsibility was happening elsewhere in the organization at a different scale. The councils and various public sites, like schools and leisure centers, began in the 1990s to buy their energy to a central procurement scheme run by the council. Again, the motivation here was to cut, to cut costs by collectivizing purchasing power. So as a result, energy bills passed directly to the council finance department to pay. Whilst energy control remained local to the sites, oversight of that energy was given to someone in a different part of the organization in a different location. The consequences of this change became clear when the Energy Council in 2009 formed an energy team. Uh, this was in response to national legislation that required all large organisations to monitor and annually report their energy consumption. The energy team oversaw the installation of a large technology project in which smart meters were installed at all council facilities across the county. In total, uh, 1,500 gas and electricity meters now report data to this team in real time. Through monitoring this data, it became apparent that many of the sites were using energy in what appeared to the energy team to be a completely dysfunctional way. 
So boilers might run over the weekend when the school is closed, or lights and computers might be left on overnight. In one case, a combined heat and power unit, or a CHP, uh, which was installed at a swimming pool, uh, was found to be venting on the heat outside the building, which has been on for two years before anyone noticed it. Because local knowledge of the site was separated from the other site of energy use, it wasn't to be added to the MCT in this way to be able to be identified. And this leads me to a certain case that I'll talk about, uh, about uh, choosing to talk power vacuum. So this case focuses on attempts to go beyond just monitoring and also enact some kind of remote management of energy consumption. And this is again taken from the same council. So today the energy team has uh, what we thought of as a te technology enabled phenomenon through which to monitor energy consumption across the council and state. Uh, through some software called System Link, the energy team can see the current and historic data from all 1500 smart meters. And this is uh, an example of what we get from the system. This is from, um, this is a library, uh, uh, this is a boiler of the library, so this is gas consumption. And um, this is a 24 hour period, and there should be a kind of an on and off period when the when, when building is closed, you wouldn't expect people to be using much, but it turned out that the uh, kind of offset setting for the boiler was 18 and a half degrees, so it was never actually switching off, it was just cycling between high consumption and very high consumption. And this was common, apparently. Uh, so at this point, optimizing energy use, you would imagine, would be a fairly easy task. Uh, of course, it was anything but. In practice, the panopticon offers a very narrow field of view. Energy data is marked rather meaningless about the context in which it's generated and used. To take the uh, example of the CHP unit that I just mentioned, without knowledge that the CHP unit was at the site, no amount of monitoring of this system link software would reveal an issue. Uh, indeed, the problem, which was venting its heat outside the building instead of into the building, was the very thing that kept it hidden from the software. More profoundly, considering the context raises the question of what it is that qualifies as energy waste. From the energy team's perspective, built through the system link software, waste is essentially any energy consumption that is significantly outside the hours uh, at which the site is open. The energy team are not able to act on this definition, though, as their organizational mandate only extends to the monitoring and reporting of energy. It does not include any alterations to the site itself. This is the job of another team called Buildings and Maintenance. There was a common complaint among the energy team that the BNN system fails to act on their identification of wasteful sites. And for this reason, the energy team stated that uh, this kind of dysfunctional energy use was common even today. Not surprisingly, when I spoke to the BNN, their perspective was rather different. They did speak, interestingly, of working closely with the energy team to reduce energy consumption. However, it was clear that their conception of what counts as waste was very different from that of the energy teams. This stemmed from a difference in their core function. For the energy team, it's obviously was about producing uh, energy use. Uh, for BNM, though, it was about keeping the site itself functioning. So, uh, a concern for the material integrity of the site, for example, avoiding pipes freezing when it got cold, or the fabric of the building getting damp, outweighed the minimising of energy use. So the BNN system link view was insufficient. In the words of uh, Surveyor in the Building Maintenance Team, he says, um, in order to read system link properly, you need to understand the operations of that site. Because we've had it now where it's using electricity on Sunday, for example. There are reasons why this is happening. And these are reasons the energy team wouldn't be able to access from their position. Uh, the three hubs uh, where the council um, administrative staff worked and, and the bulk of uh, council staff were uh, there was a third party involved in the process and that's the facilities manager who's in charge of that site. Their core function differs again. The FM at the Arrow Grove site I spoke of previously, um, uh, and this was the case of the other sites as well, did consider energy reduction to be an important part of his role. However, the true determinant of his actions were that's of keeping the users of the building happy. Uh, and so this is actually from a, a different site, the facility manager said, uh, we put a plan in place to reduce energy, uh, which was at the time we dropped all the lighting to 60%, and tweaked some of the times on the lighting. It came very quickly back at us. 
the go to a director and the director says to us, you do what I tell you, put it back on again. At the end of the day, we're here to do what we're told. We're not allowed to say no, basically. So this can be read as a further irrationality. Whilst management would commonly side with an occupant rather than reduce energy use, uh, if that occupant was complaining to them, uh, we saw a narrow growth case where they simultaneously implemented what was a highly unpopular program that drastically limited occupant control of space, and this was done in order to reduce energy use. So there's a contradiction here. There are, there are other energy actors as well, of course, and each has a different orientation to use depending on the expectations of their role. So, uh, Booms and Maintenance team members spoke of um, the cleaners. The first thing they do when they come in at 6 a.m. in the morning is to switch on all the lights to show that I'm here and I'm doing work. Uh, the energy te an energy team member gave an account of the energy audit and came in to do the audit and gives a certificate. He doesn't look at any hard data, just the paperwork. He doesn't want to cause a fuss, he wants to give a good score and keep the client happy. He wants to get paid. For my last story, I'm going to talk about a different site. This was a creative industry <coughs> incubator. The building was owned and was half occupied by one company, and the rest of the space left to various smaller startups. And this is a picture of one of the um, smaller companies in the building that uh, did uh, vision work for media. Um, as, you, as you might guess from the photo, it was a refurbished old building, so you can see the uh, single blaze and the frame windows. The site was particularly interesting from an energy point of view because business was growing and it was reaching the limit of its energy supply, the capacity of which was the legacy of its age. Uh, and this is a trace of uh, energy use at the site. So you can see that this is about three and a half weeks of data. So you can see the five peaks corresponding with the work of days of the week. And on the third Monday, for some reason, um, I think it was even very cold to keep that electric heaters on and it was hot and the air on. Uh, but you can see it came very close to reaching the limit of the building's capacity. Though the site had a facilities manager, energy that this site was looked after by an on-site electrician who was very worried, worried about this problem of, of reaching the peak. Despite making it clear to management, they continued to introduce new demands on the electricity system without consulting with him, and he was left out of this decision-making process. It appeared as though management saw the electrician as a way of not having to grapple with this complex problem. In his own words, he said the building in particular is right on the limit and you can't seem to get it through to them that the chain is going to eventually snap and they keep adding weights onto it. Uh, the head of technology, who is his boss and involved in the decision making, said realistically it's one of those problems we try not to think about. Which is kind of honest at least. So the reason this story is particularly interesting to me is because the head of technology reported a rather unique event to me. Uh, in Pierce and Paulus's work, Phenomenology of Human Electric Relations, they identify four different relations to energy. Uh, and these are background relations, embodiment, thermonutic, and alterity relations. The most direct, immediate of these is alterity relations, which is where the objectness of the technology comes fully into presence. Uh, as anyone who's read, for example, the Elizabeth Show's work will appreciate, electricity is most commonly a background relation. Um, and its role in the experience is essentially invisible to the user. A rare example of when energy becomes an alterity relation is when the batteries run out on the device, and in its absence you become more to aware of the importance of that energy. But the creative indicator there is a different example of this. So this is uh, a picture of the control desk of Chernobyl. It's uh, a capacitator desk mixing desk for uh, the Eastern Sound Studio. Um, so, and we have one of these uh, at the site to record bands in their studio. Uh, so the head of technology who I quoted from previously is also a sound engineer who uses this equipment. And in fact, before he became head of technology, his role at the site was a sound engineer. So this is called a, a Neve GR. Uh, and it's obsolete by today's standards, but it continues to be used by aficionados for the acoustic qualities that it lends to the music it records. The head of technology was having a problem with this, however. He would find that he would record his track at the weekend with a band and then would come in to listen to it on a Monday morning and it would sound different. After much head scratching, he realised that what he was hearing was the building's power supply. Fluctuations of demand change between an empty building and a full one, but even their imprint on the desk is sensitive electronics. <coughs> this is pretty much as direct a relation with energy as you'll find. 
and he experienced this personally. And yet for organizational planning of which he was a part, energy remained invisible, or more accurately, the electrician remained tasked with keeping it invisible. It might have been heard, but it wasn't to be seen. So to try and uh, link some kind of coherence to these three accounts, uh, there's a couple of things that I think stand out. Firstly, how elusive an object energy is. To experience it directly is highly dangerous and considerable effort is expended on designing infrastructure in such a way that this doesn't happen. To varying degrees it makes sense through technology, but these experiences are mediated uh, and obscured by the device itself. At the same time, it is ubiquitous, of course, and essential to the functioning of our infrastructure. Contemporary fears of climate change and fuel shortage have created an organizational requirement to march to not just the physical properties of energy, but also its institutional properties. Acting upon it in its way relies on it being fixed. This is the process of social construction in which different roles receive energy and implications for their actions. The energy team, it is a trace on the chart that reveals waste and inefficiency. For the site clean they're looking on the lights of an empty building at dawn, it is a loud declaration that they are present and that they are working. Just as important as the organizational role in shaping energy is the devices through which it is experienced. So those working with the system link software are guided to a very different view of energy than those who maintain the boilers and motors that convert it between different forms. Uh, there's a final point that I haven't yet had time to fully explore. Technology is invoked as much as a means of reducing energy, but it seems that for the organization their value may be as much about bypassing institutional inertia that stems from having so many conflicting visions of it held by different organizational actors in different positions. In my work so far, I've seen repeatedly the installation of different technologies to reduce energy use, without the organizational changes to really harness this technology. And it's this that I plan to look at next. Thank you. Do you have questions? Uh, so it's a five-year project. This is about uh, 14 months in when it took us the first year to get access to the sites. Yeah. So it's a uh, yeah. Yeah. Well, well, Thank you. Okay. Now we have two questions. Can you go back to the slide with the human electricity relations? Yeah. I mean, so the, uh, this mixing board, this uh, instrument, this was an example for, no. A uh, of alterity relations in this okay. idea of this case. So, so, they, so alterity relations essentially become aware of the thing itself. Um, okay. uh, so hermeneutic relations would be reading energy through the device. So a classic example would be uh, an energy monitor. Um, background relations are standards. It's in the room by the light, we're not wearing it. Uh, and embodiment is where it provides, uh, for example, uh, I think the example they give is a drill where the, the charge is running down in the drill, so you can feel the drill beginning to respond less. But yeah, I, so it's a very nice paper to work with. Yeah. So this is from a paper? Yeah, there's a guy, Pearson Paulos, they're called. Um, Paulos is uh, P A U L O S, I'm not quite sure the pronunciation, but. Um, they're in uh, ACI, human computer interaction, but they've done a lot of stuff on energy, so get the work of yeah. Paul's group, right? Uh Piers and Paul Moss. Uh, Piers. Piers, yeah. Because I think it gets even more important the more energy is on the agenda. Yeah. Like for those people that you were know, all working day thinking about energy, your team looking at it. We get ever more, even more in everyday life, people are supposed to think about what they are in relation to energy. Yeah. So the, the common idea that energy is not something that people deal with uh, gets probably more wrong by the hour. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. I think this, uh, this framework is quite nice for kind of critiquing the, there's a lot, of, a lot of academic work and kind of um, Political focus has, and industry focus has gone on, on smart displays and giving people information and all of a sudden that all fixes problems. Um, and that's the kind of hermeneutic relation to do some perhaps compelling enough to really engage people to, to, to do what we're hoping to, which is kind of really bigger practices in some way if that's possible. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
Uh, thank you very much. I really enjoyed it. Uh, it's a, a, just to understand this a bit better on how to get to the stories you said. Um, th there's also, a, I would say, a strategic aspect of engaging with energy uh, to action something. And uh, for example, you gave that very, I, I think I read it very closely to that example of the cleaners you said, turning on the lights to kind of signify that they are there and yeah, that yeah. they matter as well. And so is that also part of this framework, you think? Um, how do you describe that one? Would be an M&L relation? I guess that would be an authority relation, yeah. Authority, rather than M&L thing. Because it's a... Yeah. M&L thing. I don't know if you thought about that one, actually. Yeah, yeah. I think so. Um, or, or perhaps the strategic aspect is absent from a phenomenology of human electrical relations. And yeah. That's the limitations of the framework. Yeah, no, it's probably more of a, um, I mean, it's better to what degree they were aware of the energy still, even though they used the energy to provide this signal. Um, I mean, I did this in the office, I leave the computer on to show that I'm there sometimes when I'm not on the desk, so uh, it's the same thing, right? Um, yeah, it's probably more of a background relation, though, because even though you're using energy, you're not necessarily aware of the energy. Um, I'm sort of interested on in the relationship between energy and energy services because with the BMS or those sorts of systems it's about that relationship, it's about, it's about regulating things like temperature as well as about the energy which is consumed as a consequence. So from your accounts it seemed as if those systems weren't being very intelligently productively used. But did you find other examples of where there was a very sort of active and skilled use of those systems? Because in research we did in a, in a hospital, we found some incredible degrees of sort of, uh, how do you describe it? I mean, this was, this was a, the BMS we talked about as a sort of living being. Yeah, and it was about a very intimate relationship between this machine that was being tweaked and pulled and pushed in different directions, yeah. and a very intimate knowledge of all the buildings across the hospital and how they respond to different measures. Yeah. Um, so I wonder how typical the sort of very sort of un unknown, un unskilled use of these systems is. Yeah, I mean, so this was a difficult site because it was a new site to the council had changed from a, um, to unitary authority, so five council combined into one, and so there was a lot of organisation change going on in separate bits, and so um, the facilities manager of that site had, at least the BMS that it was using, um, had, had drafted quite a high degree, there was a lot of, I was particularly struck by the amount of, kind of the tacit stuff that was going on, so we had this whole thing about how um, he could look at the sensors on the building, but to really do his job, what process he had to learn really was where it actually parts of the building were too hot or too cold, and if he got his data from the BMS, it would be too late because the problem would already have happened. Um, so it was kind of this, um, yeah, learning the building itself and, and learning the view of the building through the BMS and kind of making the sensor things together. Um, and there's certainly other sites, there's one private sector site I looked at where the guy was um, had really fine tuned his the BMS and, and yeah, so there are just experiences there, but um, that's what I've had to get into it. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Just a question. Uh, I think a um, very common way to refer to it now, and that to the conceptual framework for talking to it, if you like, is through money. Mm -hmm. And I just wonder where that is in your. Um, the facilities managers are quite interesting in that they've been, um, uh, I think the five I spoke to, they won't actually have an explicit requirement to reduce energy use with a monetary target. Mm -hmm. The others, it was, um, I think, it's probably reflecting the fact that they were really there to keep occupants happy, but that it wasn't kind of set out in such blank terms. But for the organisation as a whole, um, yeah, money is becoming increasingly important. In fact, the energy team is a really 
Um, well, so this council, there was, there was this kind of this energy team who reported energy, and there was a, an eco team who did um, the kind of strategic stuff rather than the tactical level stuff. Um, and this team had well, previously been like the energy and climate change team, but they've been renamed. Um, they've been renamed the eco team, but that stood for something like economic. So basically, they've been reframed in this in, in environmental austerity as, as being about um, kind of yeah, saving money and uh, economic opportunities and green growth. Yeah, so it was a crucial part of the story. What effect that actually had on energy use, I'm not sure yet. And see that only power would be like the responsible for energy. Yeah. All the strings of the nerves. Yeah. yeah. So, so the EMS team was rebranded. Uh, no, 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 so this is another team, uh, this, this is like the strategic team who are uh, kind of setting a, a vision for the whole council oh. as opposed to kind of individual sites, yeah. But now they're increasingly kind of focused on um, businesses in the local area and supporting or encouraging them to take up green growth opportunities. The energy team was supplied. Sorry, energy team. Yes, they were within the council, but they're just going to the council's energy use itself to um, meet the national response legislation. But they ended up trying to get all these problems with the energy use sites, so they were already planning. part of, uh, uh, is a preliminary part of an ongoing research that is being conducted by me, by Jean Ferreira and Christina Souza Marcos here. Uh, and we are looking to the evidence of the way of energy which in Portugal. And the reason why we are looking for this is because we saw that this is a very interesting setting to investigate the process of formation, of public development and also of decline. Uh, we go temporary of the technological niche. And the technological niche is one where technology and user specifications are still unstable. So there is not a dominant technology, and it's still everything is being uh, searched for. Uh, and uh, the other thing that makes this, this very interesting is that this, uh, the evidence of this niche is taking place in a particular context, that is the context of the uh, energy uh, and electricity production system. And there is a context that is undergoing profound transformations that are associated with the introduction of renewable energy technologies. And so, uh, if we speak on the language of the transitions, this is an area where tensions in the prevailing energy regime are creating opportunities for radical new technologies that are being developed in niches. And in this case, these uh, new technologies have strong support from uh, favorable policies, in particular in some countries, and also they benefit from the increased interest and involvement of regime actors. So this is an interesting uh, uh, context to, to look at the emergence of a niche. And in the case of work energy, in fact, uh, this niche is part of the ongoing transition process where different technologies are competing with each other for attention and for resources. And they develop in different, uh, different paces. And I think I should tell you something about wave energy because wave is the less mature of the old renewable energy technologies. So there is not yet a dominant design. There is by a variety of technologies in various stages of development. It's not yet in the market. There is some pre-commercial <coughs> applications. Um, it's a very expensive uh, uh, technology because the, it requires uh, even the, the full-scale test of the technology requires uh, an infrastructure, important infrastructures, and very high investments. Uh, it's a technology that operates in a very harsh environment, that is the sea, and so very frequently the technologies fail in the sea, the full-scale sea test. So they, they, they seem to work in the type that they are when it comes to, <coughs> sorry, to, to the sea they fail. And also, they, they share an environment with other activities, uh, that is the sea. And so there is a lot of negotiation with the different other activities that are uh, operating in, in the same space. So uh, this is an area where there is still high uncertainty, and these technologies show a very slow development when compared with other renewable energy technologies. But despite the fact that they are that is in a very lower position as compared with other renewable energy technologies, what we see is that it has 
very proactive advocates. So it, these, these advocates were able to create a vision of the future benefits of this technology and they were able to build and sustain expectations on these benefits over a long period of time. The long period of time it is taking to produce something that can be applied. Uh, and at the same time, the benefit from the policies that are being uh, deployed for renewable energy technology in general. Uh, so it was able to obtain substantial resources for R&D and for technological development. And at some point, some technologies that at least declare themselves to be uh, reaching pre-commercial stages managed to start getting investments on large energy players. Uh, the other two other things I are, are, are interesting that is they built these actors that are pro, uh, advocates of this technology. They did a, a very strong international network, uh, and this network has a very strong lobbying capacity. On the other hand, this is a technology that is very localized because it's where there are waves, good waves, and so the Atlantic coast were were among the pioneers. And at this moment, it's there is a, a strong UK leadership in this in this in this area. Although there is now some interest on regions on the Pacific and South Atlantic, and the Port Portuguese actors were among the pioneers in the development of this technology. So it makes it very interesting to look at, at the emergence of this niche in the case of the Portugal. And so, for, for, to look at this at this process, we uh, uh, use the new concept in sustainability transitions uh, as, as a conceptual framework, and the niche concept. Uh, starts from the assumption that uh, premising radical technologies, but uh, ones that are still underperforming, they need to be uh, protected against the selection processes, but the selection pressures of the dominant design, the uh, regime. So what happens is that the, the niche offers a protected space that temporarily shields technology against those uh, selection pressures, and at the same time, nurture these technologies. So provides a space where there is network building and there is learning through real life experience that enable technology to eventually become competitive in the future. Uh, and uh, when, when we look to, to, the, to the process of niche formation and development, uh, strategic niche management is a conceptual framework, that analytical framework that is interesting as um, uh, to help us to address the, the, this process. Uh, strategic niche management has a very strong poli policy oriented, uh, is a very strong policy oriented framework, but it is uh, in analytical terms, it is, it is very interesting. So, uh, what it says is that it's, it's necess it is necessary a number of uh, dimensions that are working for a niche to develop. One is what it's called the articulation of expectations. Uh, expectations are future-oriented visions that guide the activity of the actors and also enable the local actors to enroll new actors to the niche. Then there is the need for learning, and this learning is, is taking place uh, on the basis on a variety of experiments, uh, real-life experiments, and then there is necessary the formation of a supportive uh, network of actors. So uh, it's to build what can be called a constituency behind this technology. Uh, uh, strategic niche management has some problems, uh, it has some limitations and so uh, more recently there were a number of new contributions and also some uh, um, raised some questions that are still open questions and uh, we think that this, is, uh, this, this case can also be a possibility to address some of these open questions in terms of niche processes. Uh, it's, it's important to understand how the, these protective spaces come to be. That is something that's not clear. How, how the niche can break out, how, how, how the technology can break out of the niche, um, which is really the relationship between the experiments and the learning that are not is, it's not as is, is linear as, as it seems. Then uh, the, the niches are not necessarily short uh, against the, 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 the regime actors, so it's necessary to understand how is this interaction between the niche and the regime and what is the impact of this interaction on the niche development and also which are the risks for the direction of the technology for the interference of the, niche, the, the regime actors. And then there is the idea of there is not really a linearity in the processes. There is acceleration, there is slowing down, there is decline, and there is something that is the hype cycle of this. How can not? 
Uh, there is also some other things that are not very clear, which are the interaction between the competing technologies. That is something that is very uh, not well uh, researched yet. And also the, the need to look in more detail to the actual uh, strategies and networks that are built by the actors, not just the ad system level. So, considering all these, uh, we, we can have a number of research questions. So, the first is, how technology niche is formed and then how it evolves in the, these early stages. It, it means how it attracts actors or attracts resources when the technology is not yet stabilized and so there is a very high level of uncertainty. The other question that is important is how a niche that remains a, in a very, uh, for a long period of time in a pre-commercial stage sustain expectations and keep attracting attention and resources. In particular, when, when there are competing technologies that evolve faster, the other renewables evolve faster. Finally, our specific country conditions influence the process of niche formation and also the development and the sustaining of expectations. And at the same time, because it's a very international uh, area, uh, what is the role of the international networks in reinforcing or not the activities at the country level? And finally, what is the role of the regime actors in these processes and what can we learn about the interaction between the regime and the niche? Uh, and for, for this, we, so we, we looked at the process of niche emergence and evolution and we use for this both documentary data and some exploratory interviews. Uh, we will do more detailed interviews later, but now it's just exploratory. And our, our option was to start addressing what I call a visible layer. And the visible layer of, is, is formed by actions that were relevant enough to be documented and sometimes discussed, for instance, in the media. But, uh, and this is the list of those type of activities, research projects, research outputs, experimental activities, creation of new companies, um, business investment, joint ventures, uh, building of uh, uh, institutions that uh, are proactive in the field, uh, partnerships in research and business uh, uh, policy and policies. Uh, and what we did was to use this to, be, to build a map of what happened over time, to identify what are the more proactive players and to gain some insights into their behavior. And also, at the same time, to raise some questions on how this happened and why this happened. And this how and why will be further explored in the, in the, in the, the next interviews when we have a clear idea of this, what happened. And with this, we were also able, in analyzing this data, we were also able to uncover some patterns and uh, this supported us in the identification of periods in the niche evolution. And these are the periods we identified. So, uh, there is, before 98 days of history, there, there were some things happening, but it, it was not organized. The period 23, uh, they, they, it's not yet the niche, uh, there is something like a pre-niche, there is some activities raising awareness, there was some first experiments, but we can say that niche really started to be formed in period 4 and 5. And period 4 is the, the, the start of the process and the period 6 is what I call high expectation, when uh, there was a sort of hype. And then at period 6 there is deflating. <laughs> Since uh, the hype went down and, and there is a lot of uncertainty about the future. And I, I don't have more time to tell you a detailed story, there's a detailed story for each of these periods. But what I will try to do is to, see, to tell you some uh, things that may uh, give you an idea of what happened. Uh, so, the first thing that we talk about in, when we speak about niches is, is the, the building of the networks and the growing of these networks. And what we see here is that the entry of actors uh, accumulating over time. And we have three types of entries. The first entry, um, entry of the same actor on new functions in the, in the niche and uh, repeated activities of the, of the actors in the niche. And what we see is that uh, there is a growth and then a flattening. And if we look of not the accumulated but the real entry in each period, we see a very, very clearly that we, we have a rise and not. And we have a rise not only in new entry, but also on the repeat actions of the existing actors, and that is a serious part of it. Uh, we also uh, saw something about learning through experiments and other activities, and what we see here is the same, that there was in fact a learning 
through the development of a great variety of activities. What we see here is how I categorize the, the great variety of activities in a number of, of uh, types. So we have actors involved in R&D, uh, actors involved in experiments, actors involved in business investment, that is creation of new companies as I mentioned and other activities that are investments of this type, and then actors involved in structural activities that is uh, all of the other activities on behalf of the nation, goods, policy, institution building, etc. Et so again we see there is this hut and then this buttoning and again the same, uh, exactly the same, the same pattern. And then we, we see something that is also interesting because uh, there is the attraction of a great variety of factors. And this, uh, they, 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 these actors start to be research organizations in the beginning. Then we have the attraction of new firms that are niche firms that are operating, in, uh, introducing new technologies, developing new technologies, experimenting with new technologies. But then we have the existing firms. We have the established firms that are entering the niche. And these include incumbents uh, and includes companies in the value chain, that is companies that act in complementary activities that are relevant for the, the, the nation develop. And uh, again, we have this same. But what I think is interesting is, is this slide where you see the great variety of actors that are active in the niche. And, uh, and so we have um, two uh, actors that I think I, I would like to call your attention. First is the, the entry. And it starts in period three, and then uh, raises in period four uh, of the the um, incumbents uh, that are established companies in the energy sector. So this our great utility enters in period three and starts having activities in period four, and then raise. There is this is not the number, but it's the number of activities. So it's the, the, uh, and then it disappears in period six. Uh, then you have another thing that is very interesting, that is uh, the entry of foreign companies. Foreign companies are foreign technology developers that find the Portuguese coast and the, the conditions that are offered by the Portuguese coast and also why the competencies offered by the Portuguese research organizations is very interesting uh, and they bring their experience to the Portuguese context. And uh, they form new companies, and some of these companies are joint venture with local actors. And these, are, these local actors are um, established companies, sometimes in the energy sector, sometimes in other sectors that are looking for investment. And this is also a period where um, there, after uh, period four and period five, where there is a very firm um, uh, legislation in terms of, of um, establishment of uh, renewable energy. Uh, Activities. So there is very good uh, feeding tariffs. There is a lot of, and there is a lot of government incentive for this type of thing. So there is a, an environment that is inviting. And they, at, in period five, there is the, the uh, announcement of creation of a pilot zone. That is a place that there is uh, infrastructure for the, the establishment of these type of, of experiments. And these. Um, uh, and unfortunately, it was announced, it was established, but it's not, still not operating. So there is a number of these companies that appear here in period 5 that announced that were coming here because there was a pilot zone and, and disappeared because the pilot zone didn't uh, materialize. So, what we see also here, is a, it's also interesting, that is something that uh, we, 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 we mentioned before, uh, incumbent involvement is something that was very important in these in this, in this niche. As I said, uh, utility entered very early. It had a lot of activity, it had a lot of um, advocacy of this, of this area, and this, of course, brought other actors to, to consider that it was an interesting investment. But this is very localized, so as you see, it is in 2007, 2008, and then it disappears. And the portrait is in the, the room when, if they look at these names there, they will recognize some of the most important companies uh, operating in this sector. Uh, then we have something that uh, I also mentioned that is this story entry. So you see in the, in the, the, the higher uh, uh, line the, the entry of the Portuguese actors, and, and, uh, and you can compare the entry of, of other actors. So, uh, entry of foreign actors alone, entry 
of foreign actors to join venture with Portuguese companies and repeat the entry of, of, of foreign actors or, or, or joint ventures. And uh, the other thing that is interesting to understand is that most of these entries of whatever types of, of organizations were done in partnerships. So, um, and particularly the, the early period that is in partnership, later uh, partnerships with this, but uh, it's most frequent that the enter is done uh, or the actions are done in partnership with, with different organizations. I also mentioned something that is the, the, the importance of the international network and interestingly, uh, these are the networks uh, that were um, formed in uh, European research projects uh, where Portuguese organizations participated. Each of these was called one of the periods. And as you see, the, 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 there is a growing network and this growing network is responsible for a number of the experiments that we have Portugal is responsible for, a number of uh, uh, those new companies that decided to install their experiments in Portugal. Uh, and, and, and compared with the, the line you, you saw, this is the only area where there is no uh, deflation. The, 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 the international projects continue to be important and the Portuguese actors continue to be part of this network and they, they continue to, to participate strongly in these networks. So, what happened? Uh, what happened was that what can justify this, uh, this up and down? And what can justify this up and down, in fact, are expectations. Uh, I think that uh, there were expectations on the future performance of the technology, expectations that the technology was reaching the commercial stage and that it could be applied soon. Uh, that was uh, built by the, the, those advocates that were really, really proactive and very convincing. Uh, they had very engaging narratives on what can be done with, with this energy. Uh, because of this, uh, of this discourse, there was the, the idea that if you were in, in, if you were part of this process from the beginning, you had benefits of being in a good time position, and you could attract a number of new activities uh, in the uh, wave, and also around the wave, you could build um, an industrial cluster associated with wave. So this um, created. The, the, a great interest for a number of established companies. And there was, this was, was, was contemporary with the idea of the creation of an ocean cluster. So the wave energy was part of this wave uh, cluster, or this ocean cluster. So uh, expectations were supported in proactive policy, as I said, very favorable policies, and also very strong political involvement. Some of the experiments had the presence of a minister. So it was really strong political involvement. Uh, there was a credibility that was afforded by the presence in the niche of very powerful actors like the, 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 our big utility, and all this created a bank effect. But then, uh, expectations were unfulfilled. So, some of the experiments were not successful. The sea broke down and it went to the sea. Uh, there were uh, some delayed investments, like the one in the pilot zone and other like that. And so, some, some companies failed and did not uh, establish their activities. Uh, so there were also the, the lost opportunity of the, the, the pilot zones. And, uh, there were no more fulfill expectations, but at the same time there was the economic crisis. So there was the lack of resources, because the, the, then the companies had to uh, rethink about its investments and this is the technology that is not uh, being ready to applications of this is one we, we don't want to invest in because they need because it is more uh, rapid to reach the, 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 the results. There were changes in policies regarding energy, uh, renewable energies in general. Uh, there were strategic shifts of powerful actors, um, the large utility abundant and it abandoned uh, and went to a competitive compet 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 technology. So they, the, suddenly there was this interest in uh, offshore wind. Offshore wind is <coughs> shared some of the, the, the competences and activities, but it's faster. Um, it's, it, in, in terms of expectations, it's better because it, it is expected to produce more, it's more performant, and it also is expected to produce faster uh, in terms of, of, of being able to. Be commercial. And also, 
what this also showed is that the, 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 the coalitions that were formed uh, along this process were very fragile. They were built in, in, uh, in these expectations that once not fulfilled to let the companies to, to disappear and some of the actors also disappear. And interestingly, some of the other cases become a little less convincing. And some of them are also thinking maybe we should go also for showing because of showing this where utilities, where uh, utilities maybe we should not, not be just wave energy, but we should be offshore energy because of it, so we can uh, gain something of peak in, in that area. So, what can we conclude from this? Uh, very generally speaking, um, the, 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 the story of so far of the wave energy show us some things. Show, that, show us that there is a key role in the niche formation of proactive advocates that can formulate a uh, convincing vision of, of how the, the, the technology and its development will uh, unfold. Uh, that these expectations are very important in attracting and retaining actors, but they can also uh, lead to the losing of these actors. Uh, it, it also shows that policies are very important when a market has not yet been created and when this appears as a problem. Uh, it shows that incumbents are important for resources and for credibility, but also bring risks. And uh, show that extra local networks are very important for the local activities. But uh, we also saw that although the expansion of a network is critical, the entry of new, act new actors does not signify that we have strong coalitions. So they may uh, dissolve when things are not occurring as they are expected. It shows that the experiments are fundamental, but that uh, the uncertain and successful experiments can have very harmful impacts on expectations and uh, be negative impact. And it shows that this type of technologies that are still in this very unstable situation are very vulnerable. They are vulnerable for the changes to investment um, scarcity, to the disengagement of the powerful actors and also to competing technologies. So, just to finish, uh, what happens is that we have a technological niche, and this, this niche is before the technology and before user specifications are stable, have, are, are very uncertain, and this creates high vulnerability, and this shows that this niche development and uh, diffusion of radical new technologies. There is no, no, it's not linear, there is not a linear evolution of this. So now we have a wave, it went up, it fall. <laughs> Let's see if there is a new way to come in this. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Thank you. There's still no book in inflation. Yes. <laughs> in, fact, in fact, we are at the level of the big four now. So maybe <laughs> there is a new way to Yes, the research is Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so do we have any questions? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yes. 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 We did it for the, the project so far. We, we will do with these actors, but we are still trying to organize the information. Uh, because all, 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 as I said, most of them have, have partnerships, but we still have to, to build completely the partnerships to, to, do, the, to do the social network analysis. But of course, we find there is a number of actors that are central. There is a number of universities that are central. When the utility was around, it was central. This is not important anymore, but there is a, yeah, there is a, so it, it is something that we want to do in the future. Yeah, uh, looking for your presentation, it's really interesting to hear about all about this wave uh, technology. Uh, my question is about this um, framework of issues and uh, regimes. In, in, in my idea, um, it seems a bit strange that the incumbents are so heavily involved in these issues. Um, so the messy realities uh, catch up uh, with the, the nice uh, picture, so to say. 
Um, is it still valid to keep this idea of having a niche when the niche is actually formed by government and the incumbents, so by the regime? Um, could you not do away with the idea of niche and just focus on the expectations theory? Would that not give you enough explaining how? Uh, no, because well, in energy is very special in the, in the fact that uh, in some countries, and not in all, we heard uh, the other day, uh, in Germany is not the case, but in, in some countries like Portugal, a set of incumbents uh, from the region, uh, the, the companies that were involved in uh, fuel, uh, the conventional energies, entered the renewable energy field. And they started investing in the renewable energy field. Um, and so they did it probably for two reasons. One was they wanted to observe, to see what was happening, because this is a threat, and the threat is evolving and faster. So you should be there to see what's happening. On the other hand, they thought that uh, if, if the things, if they need to have a strategic uh, position in this, in this field because it seems to be, uh, have some promising uh, future. So uh, they are there. Uh, to observe and for strategic reasons. reasons. Um, but that does not mean that the techno some of the technologies uh, don't remain technologies that are still in a niche stage. So they are not yet developed. And this is the case, this is the case of WAVE. I would say that consuming is not anymore a niche, uh, but uh, WAVE it is. So, and, and what happened here shows exactly that. So that there is a, a core of actors that are um, acting in behalf, in, in behalf of this technology uh, and they sometimes are able to attract actors from the outside uh, because they think at some moment that they had benefit to be there and when they, they realize that they are not really benefiting as much as they should be there, they withdraw. So we, we I still think that the, the, the idea of the, the niche is, is interesting, and I still think that you have to consider um, the, that the strategies of the regime actors are very different from the strategies of the, the, the niche actors. And the strategy of the regime, the, 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 and the, 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 the fact that the, the regime actors go there can be important because they have the resources and the credibility, uh, but uh, you may also consider that they, by being there, they may deviate the trajectory of the technology. And uh, if I look to the ocean energy in general, not just the way this will happen, in fact, because the, the, in, in this case, uh, the presence of the, the, the utility deviated the trajectory. Now, the interest is not anymore in the, in the wave energy, it's in offshore wind, because they are powerful in, in wind, so they want to move from the, 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 the onshore to offshore. So there was a real deviation of the trajectory because of the presence of the, the, the region actors. So it's important to still maintain this uh, conflict, potential conflicting uh, uh, activities. Sorry, to make from what you said, um, you said wind, wind is not an issue anymore, but offshore wind is still is an issue? And yes. In a sense, yes. Um, yes, I think so. Uh, because um, uh, the, the problem here in, in, in a renewable energy technologies, as I said, that there is this various technologies that are competing with each other. And, uh, and, uh, and they are competing with each other and they are in different positions uh, in different countries. So, uh, it, uh, it's an issue in some places, it's, all, it's breaking out of the niche in others. No? And I think that uh, that are offshore is And do you think um, it's taking uh, actors from the way energy in niche and is there a relationship between actors and niches? Because actors are in different niches. Some of them, some of them are in different niches. And then also their strategies influence the, the, the way the niches evolve. And then the, 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 the networks and the coalitions they can form in, in, in the different niches 
probably have some influence on the way one issue falls in a position of the other. And this is something that is not well researched at all. Uh, all competing technologies that are in fact sharing this case, they share the regime, <laughs> but they are, if they are all competing to uh, change the regime, all they uh, influence each other, and I think this is something that really deserves some uh, more uh, in-depth research. Any more questions? Uh, I didn't uh, grasp that in the slides, but uh, did you consider the very big importance of the financial crisis on this decrease course? Uh, the financial crisis, um, in fact, um, brought to the surface the fragility, the fragilities of, the, of this, of this uh, system based on expectations. Uh, when the expectations are reduced, uh, the, the interest of some of the actors that are not all of the image. But in fact, it did not prevent the GDP to go so it's, it, did, it did not prevent the actors that abandoned uh, ways to go to offshore wind and to develop offshore wind. So, uh, in fact, what it, sh it has shown is that when money is short, you invest in what is more, in what seems to be uh, more, more stable. Uh, uh, this is uh, a paper from uh, this is, uh, a real paper, but uh, at the very preliminary stage. Um, uh, and uh, the others are the uh, end Christina. Christina is always there. We, uh, we are from the HP and the NSF. Yes, and uh, this research has been uh, carried out uh, in within a good project test transition to an environmentally sustainable energy system, funded by the Portuguese Research Council. Uh, this paper has a title uh, New Technology Intensive Burns and Gifts as Conveyors of New Energy Technologies. Um, uh, so, in this paper, we are going to present a very preliminary analysis of these indicatives that we are uh, uh, studying. We are still at the stage of uh, collecting uh, information directly from the So, we have already introduced uh, more than 75 firms or so. And we intend that our target is to be exhaustive. And we are about uh, uh, 50 or so, 60. So the project is, is underway. Um, we have uh, focused uh, here on the behavior of these new firms on 28 firms that we had collected the full, full, full information. Uh, the, the question that we address here is that uh, are these 38 firms, um, uh, the, 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 our research problem here, our research question, is that um, uh, in order to survive, these firms have to have much more than the value. Um, they have good ideas regarding technology, uh, their founders have sound academic backgrounds, uh, technological ability, they have relationships, they have networks, in fact, but they have to have more than these to survive. They have to adopt a viable business model. And uh, this is a typical thing for a small firm that is entering a new technology. Um, Uh, uh, small uh, uh, new business models have uh, uh, emerged 
uh, as a subject of the literature in management studies and also as a fact as a phenomenon made with the internet. All of you know about, have heard about, or know directly about eBay, iTunes and so on. These are the uh, new uh, business models. And in the energy there are also new business models, uh, very creative and uh, uh, they are making part of this, uh, this kind of businesses. Um, when uh, new technology and new energy technologies emerge, uh, they uh, emerge together with the creation of a great variety of small firms. Um, the reason for this is, uh, the theoretical reason for this is that new technology, as Madrid has already told, is risky and furthermore involves uh, resources that are not uh, totally compatible with the resources of incumbent firms. So uh, usually these new technologies are uh, uh, conveyed by new firms and are uh, introduced in parallel with the creation of new firms, new engines. Furthermore, these new technologies uh, create opportunities for new entries. Um, the transition literature uh, is a huge body of literature. Um, it's concerned mostly at macro level, uh, at the level of regimes. And, um, uh, and it addresses the small front strategy in fact, from, in a certain way, from a functional approach, uh, the viewpoint of the regime sheet of small firms protected in niches contribute uh, to the regime shift. Uh, here, uh, and uh, there are two polar uh, uh, types of um, strategies. Uh, niche stimulation or utilization uh, uh, adopted by these new firms. But um, uh, uh, furthermore, uh, in addition, these technologies uh, have very different levels of maturity. Wind is already a mature technology, PV is a um, medium. Uh, uh, mature technology, and there are others that are very uh, experimental yet. Um, so uh, they, they, they require different levels of opportunity for new firms. Um, in our sample of 28 firms, most of them by far are from BV. Uh, the, the, one of the reasons for this is one of the reasons for this is that wind uh, we have some from wind energy that uh, wind has been uh, taken over because uh, there was a takeover in effect by uh, an incumbent that everybody knows in Portugal. But uh, of course there, is, there, is, there are some and there is a number of uh, this. They are quite as regimes. Um, and uh, to study those, uh, those firms, we have adopted a business model firm that is a theoretical construct already. The business model framework uh, uh, focuses mainly on value creation and value capture by uh, the new technology firms. There are the two main pillars of the business model, value creation and value capture. Um, uh, here is the definition of a business model uh, concept as a new unit of analysis, a holistic and systemic perspective, integrating activities, including uh, boundary spanning activities, means that it involves also the relations within networks and uh, where the, no the notion of value is essential um, both to create value and to capture value. 
in this uh, particular paper and stage, we have addressed only body creation, not body capture. Yes, we are going to do this. So, uh, for the moment, we have uh, focused on body creation. Uh, in physical settings, our our study is uh, from the macro uh, level point of view, is uh, the strong engagement in renewables by the Portuguese government until the present of the, 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 the current crisis. Um, uh, in 2011, uh, Portugal ranked 30 in Europe in the share of renewables in electricity production. Um, and uh, there was the guys being a great progress on the energy, second half the right. And uh, a downturn of policy, there is a half of downturn of policy. Yes, already uh, said this um, So, when we look at the evolution of uh, electricity generated from renewables, um, in Portugal and the European Union, uh, this uh, chart, this um, figure, reveals that Portugal is quite above the, the average of the, the um, quite above. But uh, with a lot of situations uh, due uh, to climate uh, variations, but also to, to, to other factors. Um, and, um, you have uh, reached a big uh, um, uh, there is uh, of 50 percent of uh, electricity generated generated by uh, renewable sources in 2010. Okay. Um, uh, here we can uh, have an idea of uh, how the countries react regarding this, uh, this, uh, this issue. Portugal um, ranks third in the poll in 2011. The two uh, best performers are Sweden and Austria. Sweden here. Sweden here and <coughs> Austria there. And then Russia. Um, some uh, very advanced countries have a very low performance, like France, uh, the Netherlands, and so on. Uh, and of course, France is the best in the world in the new world, as, as, as everybody knows. But the um, uh, Netherlands is a, case, a very interesting case study because this is a for a different reason, it becomes uh, very bad indeed. Uh, this figure shows the, the evolution in Portugal uh, regarding the composition of the generation of electricity from the world. And uh, I only wish to stress the fact that the uh, wind has uh, the green part of the world has been uh, has been uh, increasing uh, in a very consistent way. Although uh, the large share remains large hydro, um, uh, but also we yeah, have also biomass and uh, a small share of solar PV, a small share of of and so on. But the wind has increased a lot, not replacing yet the relevance of large hydro. Um, this is from the 95 to um, The methodology we have adopted in this study is um, uh, we have uh, introduced to a questionnaire uh, very detailed um, the, the founders of these businesses, of these companies. And we have uh, addressed questions on their main current activity. 
the product technology integration <coughs> services vision or commercialization of uh, third party uh, technologies. Um, uh, we have also a um, question about their business strategy by price, technical enterprise, quality, innovation, technological innovation, or by design projects. Uh, we have then a series to, to rate uh, their strategies uh, uh, using the scale of a uh, different scale. We have also asked for their networks and uh, how they uh, uh, face the obstacles and opportunities put to them. And this in this paper is how the the question that the The sample is uh, our sample is regarding the year of creation is is a male of firms mostly uh, created uh, from 2007 to 2010. But some of them, one of them, is this uh, I hope for it. But most of them are considered in some sense to some uh, they are most of them are small firms except a few of them. So uh, and even micro firms. Uh, I, I, I would say that most of them are micro firms. And two ten. Uh, we have three large firms. And one more because of the turnover has to be considered a uh, large one. Um, this is the turnover. So you can find that we have three of the 38 that have more that have turnover over five five million skills. Uh, I can uh, speak about them as mostly small. The main activity is uh, by far uh, it is the range of the circle. It is to develop and commercialize their um, products. And then uh, uh, the second large uh, share uh, is the additional services. As you can see, it's the green part of the circle. The other cell uh, or license technology and the uh, cell for projects or technologies or integrate on products with other products are uh, less representative here. As to their business strategies, 50% uh, uh, rely uh, on uh, technological innovation. Uh, 39 on the uh, uh, okay. strategy uh, relying on quality and 11% on design contracts. Um, um, we have identified uh, using the, the domain and uh, Issues of the business strategy world and the main people who have identified four business models. And we have dropped three companies yet because of their small number uh, that has as main design of projects. And uh, uh, the companies are distributed across these four business models. And we have studied these business models using. It's a very descriptive uh, process to know. And uh, uh, by visual observation of uh, uh, the distribution of the uh, firms regarding the dimensions of the innovation strategy that, that I am not able to describe here. What just to, to explain a little bit, we have here, this is model one, two, three, four. 
Uh, these are the dimensions considered regarding the innovation strategy. Um, and this is, of course, repeated here and here. Um, by visual observation, it is obvious that the business models are very different regarding innovation. Um, their strategy, their own strategy. Um, skip. Um, skip. Um, uh, we have also analyzed networking. Um, uh, they use informal and formal networks to access 17 different kinds, uh, different resources. And networks appear as very important. But the patterns are very difficult to interpret in, in, in visual terms. We have to uh, uh, different medical uh, techniques. And we have also uh, studied the obstacles put to the firms. They are quite different. Uh, the, the, the different uh, they merge uh, between the four business models. There is a huge diversity um, as to uh, the, 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 the obstacles that they elect as the most important across the four business models. And for instance, the business model one that uh, uh, combines uh, uh, as a main activity uh, the, the uh, products or technology as a main activity and uh, uh, as a business strategy based on innovation. The technical risk is considered as the, more, the most relevant cost. Um, and the others elect as the, the more important the most relevant obstacles, other aspects. This is the, 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 the chart figure. And the uh, as opportunities is about the same. Um, the figures is also very different. So, the, what can we conclude? What can we um, draw from this preliminary uh, study. First, um, we have studied 28 firms and we will apply this framework to uh, the rule that about 50 or 60 firms. Then the business model framework is uh, powerful and really speak twice because it studies and analyzes both value creation and value and model capture, in fact, is uh, the commercialization of the technologies is a very relevant aspect for the firms to survive. If they have a good technology, but they are not able to commercialize it successfully, they will not survive. This is a, um, a major point, not only in the literature, but in fact, in empirical terms. And this framework allows to study both aspects. Um, uh, a second conclusion is that uh, even with the small sample, because this is yet a small sample, there is a huge diversity of business models. And the business models uh, are related to different forms of networking, of facing obstacles, of facing opportunities. Uh, of course, this has policy implications. Uh, we cannot deal with this Funds, uh, in a homogeneous way, in policy terms, because they are different. Um, uh, so, we have uh, really studied, uh, identified for, for, for business, for business models, built according to the major dimensions that I mentioned, um, and uh, uh, the discontrastic patterns will be checked, confirmed through uh, uh, another statistical techniques. So we'll next we'll integrate other dimensions, we'll extend the sample. We, we are already doing that 
and we will, we will explore uh, in detail the patterns observed uh, using more sophisticated techniques. Um, the, the reason for this is that I think it's uh, uh, The reason for this is that uh, these firms, it's not a question of <coughs> different uh, technological areas, in fact they do. The question is that they are quite diverse, they are not homogeneous, they have to be addressed using different, uh, diverse uh, measures and uh, for them, in addition they are at different maturity levels, but they have to be addressed as diverse individuals, uh, not homogeneous individuals, even or, or most of them be being small. Well, actually, a remark. I was a bit challenged about um, presenting the Netherlands as an interesting case study. Uh, because, uh, well, it was rather shameful to see us uh, lagging uh, very much behind on the renewable business. In fact, our most successful export product seems to be the multi level uh, perspective. <laughs> 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 but that is how they are. <laughs> <laughs> Something about an explanation, uh, as an explanation of this lagging behind, we have quite a large natural gas. Uh, and, um, uh, 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 reserves, um, and which, which causes this also called the Dutch disease. Uh, because having so many uh, resources in the one country makes you kind of lazy. Um, and that by Natural gas. So, uh, yeah. um, it makes you lazy as a country. Uh, and when you compare countries, you see that they are lagging in innovation and in um, education uh, and it has other, yeah, other effects which may influence um, also the, uh, our dependence on large um, major players, energy players and energy provision based on natural gas. Uh, we don't have to invent anything because we have this gas. So this is one of the explanations that I could offer if you are really thinking about uh, studying the Netherlands. Thank you, but uh, oh. what, uh, what I read about was by the one and the other that we got in And the author writes and speaks about the, uh, the policy being quite erratic regarding the, the subsidies. And so, um, as not, they have, you have not had, uh, you have not had um, a consistent policy over the years. And this probably makes a difference. I mean, the, 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 the consistency of policy is very important for this sectors. And that both explains uh, the poor performance uh, by the question of and we must go on in line of the law for by the inconsistency of the policy. That's, that's absolutely right. But behind that, there's, there's, a, reason, there's a cause of this erratic policy. Yes. Okay. 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 Uh, you, you said that there were different types of companies from different energy sectors. Yes. Uh, and, uh, in fact, energy sectors are almost different sectors. Although they are all energy, that there are so much differences between uh, the behavior of companies in different sectors. So my question is, did you find any relationship between the specific business models, specific modes of networking or whatever, uh, for companies in specific uh, energy sectors? Um, for instance, in 28 firms, we had only three firms from wind. So um, they, we don't have enough people mass yet to make that, to try to, to, to identify correspondence between business models and technology because 
Santa Costa was uh, quite um, underrepresented by the Indians, only through some sense. Most of them are really poor. Most of them are poor. What do you have to say? Okay. Thank you. Did you find any did you find any relationship between the companies that have grown very, very quickly and had um, high uh, revenue or at least an over turnover um, in a very short period of time? Did you find any correlation between those companies and their success? Not necessarily the good performance and the business model. But yeah. if you could ask, is, is, is that the business model superior to the other ones? Or, or maybe maybe they had different business models, but they had something else that they had in common. We are not testing Because one of the dimensions that we want to test is performance. We have all the measures of performance that we are not testing. I'm not able to say if uh, whether no. if a business model is yeah. is uh, more promising than the others. We have not the same. So do that. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.